Muraho Nesa. I hope I didn't butcher your greetings in your language. Just me who want to say hi, as you may know already my name, Maven. I'm 41 years of age, and I will be your speaker during this webinar. I want to, first of all, extend my gratitude to the organizers of this webinar. This has been a um, fascinating back and forth with uh, brothers and sisters from your churches and for a few months, and I'm grateful that finally we can make it. Uh, I want also to bring to you, share with you the greetings and the prayers of our local church. Uh, I'm act actually recording from the local church here in Mauritius. So it's a real pleasure to be able to be with you, even not physically, but we can, by the providence of God, still communicate. Um, so before we start, I was uh, wondering if it would be appropriate to just take a few brief moments of your time to just introduce myself, not that I want to focus, but so we can um, maybe uh, remove anything that may prevent anyone from uh, properly listening to these sessions. Why am I speaking? Who is this guy? And can I trust what he is saying? So let me introduce myself. Who am I? Firstly, I'm a Christian. I've been born again uh, by the saving, amazing grace of God 23 years ago. And I've been growing in the church, um, getting to know more and more God since 23 years of age. So I'm a Christian. Secondly, I am a family man. I am blessed to be married to Nella, my wife, and we are blessed to have three wonderful children. And I am the pastor of my home. I am a family man. And thirdly, I am a churchman. By churchman, I mean I love the bride of Christ. I love the bride of Christ and I serve her. I serve in the church and more and more the Lord has been equipping, revealing, affirming gifts, so much so that I help actively in the church leadership, in the preaching, teaching, and Lord willing, next year I will be ordained as the pastor of our local church. I will join the body of elders here. So I'm a churchman. Fourthly, I am a professional man, professional in regards to the topic we will be addressing today. I have been working in the field of branding, design, and advertising, website, everything in regards to creative communication for the past 22 years, locally and internationally. So I have been acquiring skills and expertise, having worked in various fields of uh, media, and fifthly, I am a media ministry man. By media ministry man, what I mean is the blessedness uh, that I have to be able to use all this experience, skills, gifts that I have been acquiring by the grace of God throughout these years and to use it for the church, or rather for the churches. I have been blessed to help various solidly biblical church and churches, ministries, and events um, internationally. Many of which in Africa, you may know, um, your, one of these uh, churches in Zambia, like Kabwata Baptist Church, and many others in Zambia, in South Africa, in USA. I, I have been really blessed by technology and media to be able to help. We help, I help them by the grace of God, because I have founded a ministry, a non-for-profit, free of charge, professional, world-class branding, design, social media graphics, even graphics website, uh, design and development for churches that need it, but maybe don't have the means for that. So we deliver world-class quality work, whatever the Lord allows us to. Um, and that has been a real joy uh, for me and privilege with the support of my church and any other uh, supporters and the needs in media and arts for solid biblically churches to communicate appropriately and effectively, the need is big. So I'm glad to be able to play a little part of that. So all these things I just mentioned are the reason maybe why I have been um, speaking at such an event. And I hope this helped you um, get rid of any doubt. But it was never my intention to make the spotlight on me. I want us to, before we dive into this session that will, where we will really engage the mind. So be, right now I'm just um, giving you a clue of what to expect. Expect that your mind will be engaged. So um, 
before we dive in it, I will ask you, if you don't mind, to just bow your head uh, with me and let's go before our Lord in a prayer because we don't rely on me, but on him. Let us pray. Father Lord, we want to thank you for every soul present, listening or watching to this webinar. Lord, use me as your mouthpiece. And may everything that is true and, and, and loving and accurate and praiseworthy be instilled in our hearts, Lord. Lord, you are omnipresent. You transcend barriers, borders, and you are with me right now, and you are with brothers and sisters attending uh, this webinar in Rwanda. Lord, we pray that you take pleasure in it and you bless us with your presence, and we pray to you because you are omnipotent. Lord, you know where we are, where we stand on this matter, on this topic. You are the one, Lord, that changed heart, that encourages those who are maybe tired, discouraged. You are the one that convicts, that convinces, that brings to repentance, that change mind in conformity with our Lord and Savior. So, Lord, be at work. Holy Spirit, work within us this morning or evening. Um, Lord, we pray ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, the first session that we will look at is called, it will be the foundational um, session for all the sessions that we will have today. It's called A Case for a Christian Mind in Media and Arts. A Case for a Christian Mind in Media and Arts. So, let me ask you a question right at the beginning. Who gets to decide about anything? Stick with me, that's not a weird question. Who gets to decide about anything? Normally, the one who gets to decide about anything and everything is the one who reigns over everything. So again, we can ask this question, who gets to decide about everything? Who reigns on everything? And the answer will lead us to this topic, this foundational topic of the Lordship of Christ. I bet you didn't see that coming, did you, for a Media and Art webinar, and we are speaking about the Lordship of Christ. And I, ho I hope, my prayer is that indeed, you, we will all see together that this is the very foundation of what we will be talking today. Don't take my word for it. Let's go into Scripture. I will invite you to, if you have your Bible, to turn to John 1, verse 1. One to three. If you don't have your Bible, we will put the verse on the slide. Um, John 1, verse 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 1 to 3. If you don't have your Bible, we will put the verse on the slide. Um, John 1, verse 1 to 3. In the beginning was the the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And notice this, verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now stay with me. Let's go to another portion of scripture. In Philippians 2, verse 9 to 11, Philippians 2, verse 9 to 11, therefore, God has highly exalted him, meaning Christ, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen? I want to show you another portion of Scripture worthy of noticing for us today. Colossians, first chapter of Colossians, as from verse 15, he is the image. He, here is Jesus, referring to Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He 
is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, everything, brothers and sisters, that in everything he might be preeminent. He's talking about the preeminence of God, the lordship of Christ. So, questions for us. Is there any part of the cosmos, of the universe, is there any part of the universe that Jesus is not Lord of? And hold that question in your mind. I want to direct us together to the same question that Steve Turner asked. Steve Turner, he wrote a book on where he was linking media and art with the Lordship of Christ. He wrote a book called uh, Imagine, a vision for Christians in the arts. And he asked this rhetorical question, and I quote, how much of life is Christ Lord over? Is he only interested in that part of life we think as religious and spiritual? Or is he interested in every facet of our lives? Body, soul, mind, and spirit. And the answer to this question, brothers and sisters, is Jesus is Lord over everything, every aspect of life. He is interested in every facet of our lives. And yes, Jesus is Lord over media and arts. So we know that to be true, right? That Jesus is Lord over everything. But do we really live as if we believe that? In other words, do we often fail to practice this belief that Jesus is Lord over everything? And thus by this failure, we tend to repeat. We repeat by this failure an old heresy. An old heresy called Gnosticism. Gnosticism holds to the radical dualism of good and evil. And Gnosticism believes that secret knowledge is necessary for salvation. And one aspect of Gnosticism, the practical consequences of it, that is that they consider everything in regards to matter, the material world, is evil. And only the things that are spiritual, everything in regards to the spirit, is good. But we know that to be untrue. Is it, don't, don't we? Not only untrue, it's unbiblical. But somehow, especially in media and arts, we live like that. What I mean by that? On Sunday, when we come to church, that's spiritual, right? And we say, that's good. Bible studies, we say it's good. Every time we have our daily devotion, every time we pray, every time we praise God, all these spiritual things, we cry out loud that this is good, all this is good, and it's true, they are good. But then we go into the world, we go into the industries, we use stuffs, we work in workplaces, we go into this material world, but because all this is somehow not spiritual, we say it is not good. It is not our business. And then what we do? We leave it to the world. And the world rejoices in that fact. And let me tell you straightforward why it is a grievous mistake. Not only we leave to the world what is under the Lordship of Christ, but we actually fail to one of our mandate, our biblical mandate. You see, in the garden of Eden, right there in the beginning, God, when he made man and woman, he gave them a dominion mandate, right at the beginning. Adam was to tend over the garden, God's creation. And Adam had also to do the work of creativity. For example, he had to give every names to every animals, right? He had this authority and duty to do. He was naming animals, and some names he found was quite funny. Even in your country, you have some animals with funny names. You have the olive baboon, the secretary bird, the marabou stork, and whatnot. You know better than, than me. 
But yeah, men and women being made in the image of God, God giving us a dominion mandate, giving man dominion mandate to reign over, to steward, to subdue over everything. Turn with me right in the beginning, Genesis, first chapter, verse 28, where it says, And God said to them, the woman and, and the man, the man and the woman, the, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Subdue it. We are called to subdue over everything. And I don't know if you you you, uh, you have um, you guys are also French speaking, but we do we are here in Mauritius both English and French speaking also. So in my French Bible, this word subdue over everything is subdue here is assujettir. Why am I mentioning that? Because it grasps the meaning properly. Subdue is to make something your subject. As a king, has his subjects, right? So that's what we have in this dominion mandate creation becomes our subject, us being the representative of God the Creator. So, right there in the first interaction between God and man, there we see a command to create, to exercise creativity and, and, and authority. And brothers and sisters, we are made into the image of God. Now, God himself is the creative God. As image bearers of this creator, of the, crea the creator, the one who designed the molecular structure, the one who set the rules of atoms and composed the songs of birds, the one whose sculptures of flowers and trees and the shapes of waves of the ocean, the one who painted the colors of the sky or of our skin, of the rainbow, the one who fashioned thunders, sunlight, and designed snowflakes, the greatest artist of all time, made us into his image. Then, brothers and sisters, it should be no surprise that we are called to creativity. We are called to creativity. We are called to cultivate. Being fruitful is not only limited into the creation of family, Let's, let's admit that even animal world can do that fine, huh? to just procreate. But being fruitful extends to the creation of music, of clothing, of art, of painting, of theater, of books, of films, media, writing, poetry. The creation mandate is a call to creativity, is a call for cultivation. We are called to cultivate. We are then called to fill the earth and subdue it. This is a task which, which speaks of order and beauty. We are called to set order and beauty in this creation mandate. And this task of setting order and beauty that we, we inherit can ideally relate to media and arts. It is very fitting for us. How about that for a reason? to pursue media and arts rightly. The theologian Francis Schaeffer says, and I will quote him, a Christian should use arts to the glory of God, not just as tracks, mind you, but as things of beauty to the praise of God. And he continued to quote a very wonderful phrase. He says, an artwork can be a doxology in itself. An artwork can be a doxology in itself. That's amazing. So again, we have this mandate passed down to us from the first man, Adam, a dominion mandate, a creation mandate, right? And I can, I can imagine some of you might say, well, yes, maybe, but that was when everything was perfect back there in the garden. What about sin? What about sin? What you're talking is when there was no sin. This is ideal. But now we live in a fallen world, which is true, but we more than never before, we know that when sin entered the world by the failure of the first Adam, we praise the Lord that we know that the second or the last Adam, Jesus Christ himself, succeeded, prevailed over sin and death. He succeeded where the first Adam failed, and we are 
in this lost Adam, right? Amen? And we, Christians, therefore, are not only image bearers of God, but we are in Christ. We are in His finished work. And that should be an encouragement for us. So we cannot and we should not hide behind the fact that sin entered the world. But we must relish to the fact that we live in the victorious Adam that, that, that enables us to fulfill still our creation mandate or our dominion mandate. We are able to be image bearers of God. And actually, brothers and sisters, because we are in Christ, we are able to be image bearers of God in a way that the secular person cannot. I mean, look at the mess in this world. Look at the mess of media and arts in this world. Secular words failing to rightly be uh, the image bearers of God. We have been the recipient of immense grace. 1 John, 1 John, sorry, chapter 5, verse 4 says, For everyone who has been born of God, what? Overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son? God, this is the advantage that we have. So again, yes, Jesus is Lord over everything and everywhere. And we should praise God for that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord and amen, right? But now let's turn to this question. To ourselves. On what do we have this dominion mandate? On what do we have this dominion mandate? And the answer is everywhere and on everything, including media and arts. Including media and arts, which is very powerful and important. This is what we will see forward. First, let's try to define media and arts. Arts is the expression of human creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form, but also music, theater, dance, literature, poetry, etc. And by the way, by this very definition, arts communicate something to be interpreted. Arts communicate something to be interpreted. And what's the definition of media? Media, on the other hand, can be simply defined as a vehicle. A vehicle which transports an idea, a data, that communicates something from one person to another, from one place to another via media. And actually, both arts and, and media can be boiled down to a single, a single word, communication. Communication. So, communication, this is, this is a very uh, familiar word to us, right? But what does our Christian man, mind says, reveals to us about communication? Communication is a key thread in the fabric of life. It shapes us mentally, socially, emotionally, and spiritually. And actually, communication forms and sustains society and at the same time develops and maintains individuality. It is, if you wish, the nervous system of the social and political body. Communication. The social uh, part is, is the relational part. The political body is uh, it's in regard to everything that's uh, in regard to law uh, and order. So communication is the way, this is how our Christian mind should understand it. Creation, cr communication sorry, is the way in which God is made known to us. Let's start there. Communication is the way in which God is made known to us and the way we respond to him and to one another. Now, think about it. We have a communicating God. We saw before a creative God, right? But we know also he is a communicating God. He chose to reveal himself by what? Communicating to us through general revelation and also through special revelation, through the word made flesh and through the Holy Scripture. 
if God, brothers and sisters, didn't reveal anything to us, didn't communicate to us, we would not know anything. If God didn't reveal himself to, to us, we would be, all be doomed. In fact, we should praise God that he chose out of love and for his glory to communicate to us. And now look at us. We are made into the image of this communicating, relational, loving, intelligent, and creative God. We ourselves are communicating beings. We are communicating beings. We cannot not communicate. Even our silence communicates something. Just as when God seems silent to us, it still communicates something. So we can say, no pun intended, that we communicate because he first communicated Remember, love is the motif. Love is the motivation of him revealing himself to us for his glory, communicating to us. So we communicate because he first communicated. The point is, communicating is intrinsic to our nature. Our God is a communicating God. We are communicating beings. So, so much so that everything we do or not do is communication. We communicate vertically to God. We communicate horizontally to one another. We communicate to the society. We communicate, especially nowadays, to even the world. And the way we mostly do this communication, horizontal communication, is through media and art, more and more through media and art. And we already saw the what is media and art, and the why of we uh, why we communicate, right? But now let's turn our attention on why is media and art said to be? I don't know if you caught me uh, a few minutes ago, but we call media and art very important and, in fact, very powerful. Why that? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, media and art deals primarily with the most active way of communication. It's a massive, multi-billion dollar industry. It's a massive industry having a massive impact in any country of the world, in Rwanda also. In fact, every important industry in the world, every important activity in the world, every important business of the world relies heavily on media and arts. It is that important and powerful. One cannot simply escape media and arts nowadays. It's everywhere. Actually, you are on this webinar thanks to media and arts, without which you, you wouldn't have known there would be such a web webinar. Right now, we are communicating via media also. It's everywhere. It's on the way to your church. It's on the way to your home, to work. It's everywhere. You are bombarded with media and arts. And media and arts, is not passive. It is not passive. It is not also neutral. And actually, media and art is often aggressive and pervasive. All these, what I just enumerated, can be proven when we look at two basic tenets of communication. There's two P's that I want, to, want you to remember. The first one, perception. And the second one is persuasion. Keep that in mind. When we use media and arts, it basically affects our perception. And this triggers our persuasion. It affects our perception, it triggers our persuasion. And also when we are persuaded, what happens? It affects our perception as well. So, we got communication which is everywhere, every time, aggressively and pervasively. And these two tenets deal effectively with our perception and persuasion. So you and I can fairly say that what we got here, communication, media, arts, is very important and thus very powerful also. Affecting perception and per persuasion, that's a very powerful thing to do. Remember we spoke about our biblical mandate and about um, the order and beauty, right? That we are called to creativity, we are called to cultivate, we are called to set order and beauty. But what we just 
well, what we just saw highlights another point. We are called to exercise power. We are called to exercise power. We are not called to leave that powerful and important thing, which is media and arts, to the world. But as the image bearers and those who are enabled in Christ, unable in Christ, enabled, sorry, in Christ, we are to exercise this power. Power, you say. So the question, what do these three things, um, order, beauty, power, where does all these three things dwell together? Where you see order, beauty, power in the same place or rather in the same person. And the answer is obviously, I bet you already know it, is in the person of Christ. The personal Christ, and we are to imitate him, right? So actually, if we consider only the power aspect, just for a moment, now what happens when power is not under control? We are looking to Christ as our model. What happens when power is not under control? And it reminds me of Christ's character of meekness. Jesus Christ was meek. And, and on the contrary to niceness, meekness, biblically speaking, when we say Jesus was meek, meekness here means power under control. Jesus was meek. He has his marvelous divine power, but under control. So again, what happens when power is not under control? Nothing like Christ happens. That's for sure. Nothing good happened, right? And that's what happened when Christ, not Christ, sorry, Christians are not fulfilling the mandate. They leave it to the world. Those who have power but no control cannot control it. So having understood that, brothers and sisters, that Christian by far and large had abandoned, left this power not under the right control, what happened? The world had laid its hands upon it. Its grip are tightly on media and art, and they do as they want, as they please, with their own agendas, all for their gain, nothing for God's fame. Love and goodness are not their goal. The glory of God is not their goal. And before we blame them, we need to have a good look at ourselves first and see if we are obeying or not this dominion mandate. Did you know that, for example, media and arts played a capital role during times of war? I'm sure you know, sadly, the story of Rwanda uh, also uh, highlights this, but I want just to maybe move your attention uh, away to maybe World War One and World War Two, even though factually every single war, even the war that most uh, the pr press is is writing about, um, the war of Russia and Ukraine war, is something very common. Use there's a tool very mighty and powerfully used. There's a role of media not uh, used here, and the the way they use it is via. Propaganda. They use media and art, but they call it propaganda. Because pro what is propaganda? Propaganda is the strong usage of media and art to coerce perception and to persuade. And propaganda is very effective. Hitler himself in Germany, Nazi Germany, lost his first world war because he says he lost the battle of propaganda. And he pledged to have his own propaganda machine, his own propaganda system, which he did in World War II, and it worked for him. And many before him, and many after him, many in Africa also, has done the same thing, the weaponization on, of media and arts, propaganda, using the two Ps, remember? Perception and persuasion, via yeah, media and arts. And the aim of this is simply to control. To control how and what people think. That's that powerful. That's massive power. To control how and what people think. Edward Burnings, he's what's called to as, as the father of public relations, PR. Edward Burnings wrote a book called Propaganda, in which he claims that it is possible to quote, regiment the public mind every bit as much as an army regiments their body. Regiments here is control. So it is possible to control the public mind every bit as much as an, an army controls their bodies. Wow. 
That's frightening. And that's what media and arts in the secular world has been doing. They have done, they has been doing, they are doing just that. Let me give you a proof of that by sharing an old but fascinating historical event. Do you know this man? Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro was the revolutionary leader and then dictator of Cuba. So historical event, uh, what I'm about to share, happens in the time when um, Fidel Castro launched one of his invasions of Cuba. He had a rather rusty ship that got stuck in the mangrove about one kilometer offshore. So it was impossible for him to unload the supplies and ammunition. So what happened is that Castro's men, about 30 men, had to walk in the water, the water up to their necks. They had to walk to get to the shore. Their gunpowder and all their weapons got seriously wet and became obsolete in the process. By the time they reached the beach and they were exhausted, they were spotted, spotted by their enemy. Batista troop. Batista was the reigning U.S. endorsed dictator of that time. Batista's troop spotted them as a crawl inland, and Batista troop gunned them down, all of them ex apart from three, three persons, Castro and two others. The three survivors took refuge in the sugarcane field. The Batista troop knew that they were hiding somewhere in there, so they searched one row of sugarcane at, at a time, and they became fed up, so they decided to set uh, the fields on fire. Unfortunately, at least for them, they missed the one little field in which Fidel and his army of two were hiding. That night, when the Batista boys decided to get some sleep, Fidel Castro counted the head, too, which took um, a few seconds for, for him, and he checked his arsenal. They had only one rifle left. But Fidel Castro spent the night lecturing his two remaining followers. He was persuading them in order to change their perception. And the theme of his lecture was, we have won the revolution. <laughs> no kidding. So once they have escaped the sugarcane field, Fidel Castro managed to recruit four or five or other additional men, bringing his army to the grand total of seven men. Then some of his supporters persuaded one reporter from the New York Times magazine. New York Times was one, if not the most influential media outlet of the time. And he, they persuaded one of the reporters of New York Times to come down to Cuba for a few weeks of interview with the revolutionary leader, Fidel Castro. So what Castro did secretly is that he ordered his men, seven men, to change costumes and identities every hour or two. Then to come, they are supposed to come and report duty to him, supposedly as heads of massive brigades camped out in the neighboring hills. And each time one of these men reappeared as supposedly different member of this revolutionary army, they would say something like, Comrade, I have 1,000 men stationed three miles away do you want me to move closer to our target? This whole masquerade and drama lasted for seven days. Seven days they put this drama up before this reporter. And after seven days of this, the New York Times reporter was convinced that Fidel Castro had thousands and ten thousands of zealous soldiers ready to win the war camp strategically everywhere. He did his report and every news outlet wanted an interview. So, Fidel Castro did the same masquerade for every other reporter who came. And the result, brothers and sisters, every media outlet at that time was sharing about their conclusion that Fidel Castro and his massive army had practically taken over Cuba. After a year later, Batista got fed up, fed up to be made a fool by the press, he decamped. Perception and persuasion. Very, very powerful indeed, brothers and sisters. That's just one example. Whether we like it or not, whether it was good or not, the point is, it is very powerful indeed. And we ought to treat it as such. How do we approach something powerful? How ought we to approach something very powerful? With respect, with caution with preparation, with mindfulness, with boldness, with humility, with discernment. 
And only then we approach it with admiration. Most of you, I'm sure, uh, is familiar to the Zambian pastor, um, Conrad Murray. I love one of his expressions. Every time there's something good happening, uh, where we are praised, he has this, uh, this expression, powerful. And when he say powerful here, it's about the beauty, the admiration, the goodness of this power. That's powerful, right? So media and art is powerful. Media and art has real life consequences. Propaganda is very present still nowadays, very active nowadays. It has different forms in media and art, and we just fail to recognize them. Brothers and sisters, speaking of war, there is present tense, there is a battle for people's mind. There is a battle against the Christian mind. And this battle is warring through in media and arts. And I just gave an example of a time when media and arts were mainly newspapers printed posters and newspapers and radios. But even back then, media and arts was um, already shaping society, shaping opinions, shaping worldviews, shaping the mind of consumers. So you see, media and arts started to change how mankind communicate and behave through innovation and technology. Media are as much influenced by society as society is influenced by media. And the impact is mutual and continuous. A famous historian, Arthur Schlesinger, said, Karl Marx held that history is shaped by control of the means of production. That's one of the belief or teaching of Karl Marx. I'll call it again. Karl Marx held that history is shaped by control of the means of production. In our history, in our times, history is shaped by control of the means of communication. And that's true. In our times, history is shaped by control of the means of communication. That's so true. And that begs the question, which side of history are we on? Should a Christian, should a Christian mind allow for anything to alter and control his perception and his persuasion? And the answer is, apart from the truth of God, no, nothing should alter or control our perception and persuasion, right? So should a Christian mind address perception and persuasion? Yes, high time, yes. So do you see, brothers and sisters, how this topic at hand this, this um, theme of media and arts, it's not only for only those among you who work in media and arts, only for this creative or artist brother or sister. It's only for this person who wants to study arts or media, who works in media and arts. No, brothers and sisters, this very topic is for everyone. Everyone who consumes arts and media, who produces arts and media. This morning, or evening, whatever time you will be watching it, having seen its impact on media and arts, having seen the power of it, having seen how we have been mandated to subdue over everything that's under Christ's Lordship, only mandated, not only mandated, but capacitated, since we are in Christ. Having seen all that, brothers and sisters, I hope you will agree with me as we near the end of this first session, that media and art is the business of every Christian, of every Christian family, of every church, every pastor, every media ministry leader, every youth, every ministries of Christendom. It is time that we have the right mind in this domain and that we have the mind of Christ for the, in that. That we take hold of this imperative that we have in Romans 12 verse 2. That's a key verse for us. And throughout this webinar, Romans 12 verse 2, do not, that's, an, that's the imperative, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are renewed in Christ and our mind keeps renewing. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may 
discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, having a renewed mind, we should keep with the renewing of our minds. In the next session, we will see the preventive aspect of the Christian minds and our responsibility in media and arts. If you got any question in regards to this first session, I will encourage you to write them down, maybe share them with your pastor, share them with the uh, webinar organizers. Um, they will, can address it themselves, and if not, they can sh um, share it with me, and I will address it later, I promise. But I, I hope, I hope that this s s uh, first session really grasps our attention and set the things on the right foundation. Thank you for your attention. See you in the next session.